A warm-up load is on the diesel, maneuvering diesel I. Dive, dive, sound two blasts, dive alarm, dive, dive. One MC, dive, dive, sound two blasts, dive alarm, one MC, dive, dive, I. Dive, dive. Dive, submerge the ship. All vents indicate open. Bending forward. Bending aft. 36 feet. All vents indicate open. 38 feet. Deck to wash. 4-0. Four 4-5. Four Five zero. All vents shut. Scope a wash. Scope under. Open scope. Submarine operations take teamwork, planning, and practice. On every dive, the hatch and main induction must be shut tight to make sure ocean water can't enter. On command, every member of the crew rushes to his station, ready to fight a fire, control flooding, or react to other emergencies. These cities under the sea lock 140 people into a living and working space the size of a three-bedroom house. For months at a time, they work like a very close family, team members who depend on each other for survival. Because under the sea, closed in a container with no escape, there are no second chances. Entering a confined workspace is a lot like working on a submarine. You work in an enclosed environment where a fire could be deadly. An open valve could drown or trap you. Everyone's safety depends on a team approach in which each member knows and follows safe work procedures. Every year, more than one and a half million people work in confined spaces like tanks, vaults, pits, or storage bins. Many will be injured and many will not come out alive. To help you work safely in confined spaces, your employer complies with the Occupational Safety and Health Administration's permit required confined spaces regulation. This program covers your employer's confined space program. You'll learn about identifying characteristics and space hazards, atmospheric testing, other hazard controls, the confined space permit, personal protective equipment, communication, rescue equipment, team responsibilities, and contractors. Captain, the ship is at periscope depth, maintaining zero bubble. Very well. Maintain depth. Have all stations checked for leaks. On a submarine, the crew follows a fixed procedure called rig for dive prior to submerging the ship to ensure all valves and hull penetrations are properly aligned. Each item on this checklist is examined by one crew member and then double checked by another crew member. Once the ship is submerged, all spaces are checked by crew members for leaks and reports made to the officer of the deck. This is also how you work in confined spaces safely. First, you control hazards. Then you continuously monitor the confined space to make sure the hazards remain controlled. Before work begins, be sure that all hazards are controlled. But first, you must know what hazards to look for. Confined spaces can be tanks, vessels, silos, storage bins, hoppers, vaults, pits, or pipelines. However, all of them have some common features. First, openings to enter and exit are limited. Second, they are big enough for a person to fit inside, but not designed for routine continuous use by people. Your employer can document that some confined spaces pose no hazards and have no potential to develop hazards. 
These are considered non-permit confined spaces. Other confined spaces, however, contain hazards and require a permit to enter. These spaces should be secured with barriers and marked with warning signs. But don't be fooled by the absence of a sign. Check with your supervisor before entering any confined space to make sure you don't need a permit. A confined space with any of the following hazards is a permit required space. A hazardous atmosphere. The air inside the space is or could become dangerous. A potential to engulf employees. Small particles or liquids in the space could bury or drown an entrant. A configuration that could trap an employee. Maybe the floor slopes or walls converge inwardly or there's an overhanging edge. Any other serious safety or health hazard. The space has machinery that might start up unexpectedly. Electricity or extreme heat or cold. Any one of these hazards can kill or disable, so it's important to know more about them. Atmospheric hazard causes more deaths and injuries than any other confined space hazard. Atmospheric hazard usually means too little or too much oxygen. If there is too little oxygen, less than 19.5%, people get disoriented and may be too confused or weak to get back out of the space. Too much oxygen, more than 23.5%, increases the fire and explosion hazard. A hazardous atmosphere can also mean the space contains unsafe amounts of flammable gas, vapor, mist or dust, or that it has harmful levels of a hazardous substance. Atmospheric testing is a major part of every confined space program. The atmosphere inside a confined space is tested by inserting monitor probes or hoses into the space before anyone enters. The first test measures oxygen level, then air is checked for combustible gases and vapors. And finally, the space is checked for toxic gases and vapors that could cause acute or chronic illness. Gas tests are made from the top to the bottom of the space, since heavier gases collect at the bottom while lighter vapors concentrate at the top. Since employees or their representatives can watch testing and continuous monitoring, more people ensure that proper results determine hazard controls for the space. For example, special ventilating equipment may be brought in, or the space may be purged with an inert gas like nitrogen to clear out flammable vapors. Nitrogen purging, however, leaves another hazard, an oxygen deficient atmosphere that must be controlled by providing breathable air. An engulfment hazard is a confined space such as a tank filled with milk, or a bin of grain, or other finely divided particles. Engulfment hazards usually are controlled by emptying or stopping material flow before people enter. Fall protection and other system safeguards like isolation may also be required. Sometimes the shape makes a space dangerous. Maybe the floor slopes or the edges overhang, making it difficult to get out quickly. Spaces like this might need internal changes, such as building a temporary floor that's strong enough to hold everybody, including rescuers, without moving. Other hazards making a confined space hazardous are electricity, machinery, temperature extremes, or falls. Hazard controls might include locking out or tagging out electrical and mechanical equipment, blanking and blinding piping, pumping cool air in a hot space. Hazards in confined spaces must be eliminated or controlled before anyone can enter. That means you may not place any part of your body across the opening of a permit space until conditions of the permit are met. If you break the plane of the opening, you are entering the space. Submarine crews are highly trained and disciplined. Boarding the boat is allowed only after sufficient training, proven understanding of the equipment on board, and knowledge of safety processes. It's not much different for you. 
Before you work in a confined space, you'll have to read and understand the confined space entry permit. An entry permit is a form encouraging orderly planning and providing written authorization for work in any permit required confined space. The entry permit identifies the space, the scope of the work, and when it will be done. It lists the names of all team members, their duties and required equipment. Sometimes when space hazards call for special equipment, such as non-sparking tools, they are listed on the permit. Especially in flammable spaces, intrinsically safe lighting, marked with the FM approval logo, may be required. If falls are a possibility, or if special gear is needed to rescue someone who gets into trouble, safety equipment listed on the permit must be ready for use. The permit shows atmospheric testing results and measures used to control hazards before entry and throughout work. Every member of the confined space team checks the entry permit, to learn the hazards they face and planned controls. Just like in a submarine, inside maneuvers can be a matter of life or death. In many cases, people who enter a confined space will need to wear personal protective equipment called PPE. The entry permit shows the exact kind of gear needed. Some of it will be simple things like gloves, hard hats, chemical resistant clothing and safety shoes. Some will be complex, like specific kinds of respirators. People entering some spaces may need to wear an air supply respirator or a self-contained breathing apparatus. Air purifying respirators are useless in oxygen deficient atmosphere because they don't supply oxygen. But if filtering impurities will control a confined space hazard, you may use special respirator cartridges. The choice depends on specific space hazards and the type of work to be done. Your job is to consult the permit and use the exact gear listed. Now, fire, fire, fire. We have fire in the torpedo room, upper level starboard. Now, all hands, we have fire in the torpedo room. Surface, surface, surface. Although they do not occur often, accidents can happen aboard a submarine. When they do, crew members must know how to react quickly and safely. The same is true in other confined spaces. One of the problems with confined space work is staying in touch with people outside. The entry permit tells entrants how to communicate with people outside. Sometimes it's by talking, like with a radio, or by a system of signals. In some spaces, entrants wear motion-sensing alarms that sound when an entrant goes down in the space. The alarm lets the attendant know to send help. Many employers require people in confined spaces to wear full body harnesses. This equipment can make it easier to remove a fallen entrant from the confined space. Because getting out of a confined space fast is so important, learning about problems quickly is critical. The entry permit also lists rescue procedures and equipment. It shows who will perform rescues and how to contact them. It describes the kind of retrieval system that is used to pull out a person who needs to be rescued. For example, in vertical entries deeper than five feet, a mechanical hoisting device must be installed to lift out a person who gets into trouble. All rescue equipment is listed. Sometimes the permit lists other safety measures or special permits. An example would be a hot work permit for welding or grinding inside the confined space. If an emergency such as a fire occurs aboard a submarine, the mission is halted and crew members go to previously specified areas and follow what they were taught in training. During such incidents, crew members know exactly what their role is in controlling the hazards or rescuing fellow crew members. It works the same way in other confined spaces. You must know what your role is and what you need to do if an emergency occurs. The confined space entry team has four functions. Entrance, the people who go into the space to work. Attendance the people who watch over the entrance to make sure they are safe. Entry supervisor, 
the person who oversees the operation and makes sure that all permit requirements are met. Rescue and emergency services, the people who rescue entrants if a problem develops. Each of these groups has very specific responsibilities. Let's start with attendant duties. If you're an attendant, you'll remain posted outside the space to monitor entrants as they work. You'll keep an accurate list of entrants in the space. You are trained to know signs of a problem, such as slurred speech, and when these signs appear, you go into action. Many employers train attendants to read a five-gas monitor that hangs at the opening of the confined space. This monitor takes continuous readings of the atmosphere within the confined space and can serve as an early warning device if the confined space atmosphere is becoming hazardous. The attendant should record the results during the time intervals listed on the permit. You should order evacuation if 1. You observe a condition not allowed by the entry permit. 2. You notice symptoms of exposure in any entrant. 3. You see a situation outside the confined space that could endanger entrance. And four, you decide there is any other reason you cannot effectively and safely perform your duties. In an emergency, it may be tempting to enter the space to rescue a downed coworker, but unless you're specifically trained and relieved of duty as attendant, you'll stay outside. Many well-meaning but untrained would-be rescuers die trying to rescue downed entrants. The attendant is the one who calls rescue personnel and in cases of vertical entry begins non-entry rescue. Confined space entrants are like crew members who climb into the bowels of a submarine to fix a leak. They are the ones who go into the confined space and do the work. An entrant's first duty is to stay safe. That's why it's so important to review the permit and space hazards before entry. The permit lists the hazards you could face. Make sure you understand what they are and that you know what to do if trouble develops. For example, do you know the symptoms of too little oxygen, like feeling sick, lightheaded, or disoriented? To work safely, you should also double check to see that listed hazards are controlled. Is equipment really locked and tagged out? Have you placed your locks and tags on the equipment? Did you personally verify or witness that equipment cannot be started or energized? Are inflows blanked or blocked? Will the work you're doing create a new hazard in the space? Examples might be using up available oxygen, either by hot work or by exertion of multiple entrants. Your safety in a confined space is a responsibility that you share with everyone else on the team. A good example is the retrieval system used for non-entry rescue. Usually, it's a full-body harness with a retrieval line hooked high on the back or at the shoulders. If you remove any of this equipment, the attendant won't be able to hoist you out in an emergency. Cooperation continues as the entrant stays in contact with the attendant at all times. If the attendant or supervisor says, get out, do it immediately. Anytime you notice a problem, alert coworkers, notify the attendant, and get out of the space right away. If one worker believes it's necessary to leave the space, all entrants should exit. This is called self-rescue and is the best way to get out fast. The entry supervisor is sort of like the submarine officer of the deck, supervising operations, ensuring a smooth run. In a confined space entry, the entry supervisor makes sure the permit is complete, that all tests and procedures are complete, and that all equipment is in place. The entry supervisor also oversees follow-up tests and confirms that proper rescue equipment is available. Another duty of the entry supervisor is to keep unauthorized individuals away from the confined space area. No confined space entry can begin until the entry supervisor is sure everything is ready and has signed the permit. The supervisor also is authorized to cancel the permit, either because the work is complete or because there is a problem. If an entry supervisor has any doubts about the hazards in the confined space, the entry will not proceed until the entry supervisor is sure all hazards are controlled. As with submarine operations, there are layers of safety procedures and controls to make sure everything goes smoothly. But sometimes the unexpected happens.
and the crew is called to general quarters. Then the training and planning gets split-second testing. One major failure could mean crew members die. It's the same with the well-trained and prepared rescue service selected by your employer to respond to emergencies in your confined space. Although you hope never to need this team, you'll be glad to know they can respond in a timely manner with a ready rescue plan designed for the characteristics, hazards, and rescue problems they might face. Rescue team members train in the special hazards of confined space rescue, as well as first aid and CPR. They practice regularly at confined spaces where they may be called on to perform rescues. Just as all members of the confined space team need to know what they are getting into, so do contractors who come on site to work in or around permit spaces. Before work begins, the contractor and employer discuss the permit space, its hazards and precautions, and procedures used to protect employees at the site. Joint work at the permit space must be coordinated to assure everyone's safety. When work is complete, contractor and site representative debrief about the contractor safety program, new or changed situations, and hazards discovered or created during work. Sharing of information makes sure that everyone who does confined space work, whether an employee or a contractor employee, is protected from current and future hazards. Another important way you protect yourself is by gathering information, by asking your supervisor or reviewing your company confined space program. 